Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 189, Uno Ocho Nueve. Welcome back, my friends. How are you guys doing? Hope you guys are well hydrated, well rested, well limbered, well lubricating all that malarkey out there. Um, today I'm going to change things up a little bit and I'm going to bring the microphone a bit closer to my mouth because I've you know, seen in previous episodes the microphone's a bit low um, and it doesn't really pick up the sound. I think um, in my head I think I've got one of those really high quality, um, well, I'm not sure if they're called atmospheric, but I forgot what they're called, but there's these microphones that you can get that essentially allow you to put the microphone quite cl- quite far away from where your actual mouth is, but it picks up the sound. It's sort of like a, one of those kind of directional mics so you can point at a certain area and it'll just pick up the sound so like the mic that's used in tv so i think i've got one of those kind of microphones but i don't i have a regular microphone i bought from amazon for like 30 quid i plug into my directly into my computer with no sound card and no kind of you know manipulation of the sound itself so it's not the best quality so i'm gonna have to make sure i bring it up to my mouth and have it right down here bit weird bit strange but i need to get used to it anyway welcome back to the show thank you for tuning in it's the fourth day in a row fourth po- fourth podcast in a week I'm going hard, I'm not stopping, I'm being consistent, I'm going for things and I'm trying to be a better version of myself. I hope you are too. As you can see from the light coming in from the right hand side or from your left hand side or whatever side you're watching this on, it's very sunny this Thursday morning. It's super sunny, super warm. It feels like summer as a lovely Childish Gambino goes, Childish Gambino song goes, right? It feels like summer. Um... So yeah, I'm enjoying it. I'm loving it. I'm loving waking up early in the morning. I'm loving having some breakfast, some eggs, a couple of frankfurters, reading a book in the morning and just chilling and just being here with you guys before I get off to work. Today, this morning, I kind of, again, to buck the trend of previous weeks, I didn't work out again this morning, but I went for a massive, massive five mile run last night, which I'm going to tell you about in a one minute before i get into that i want to let you guys know that this friday and for the next for the, for the next what well, for this month for next month and the following month for may and for june i'll be djing every single friday at tap east in westfield stratford for my night called tapped it's going to come up here on your screen for you guys that are watching via the youtube app and for you guys that are re- listening via the podcast app i have the link attached below into the show notes so this is the party i'm playing at it's a night called Tapped at Friday the 3rd of May at Tap East in Westford Stratford. They serve great craft beer, um, a f- couple of snacks here and there. It's right on the outs, well, it's right it's at the bottom of uh, Westfield Shopping Center near the Stratford Rail Line, um, the Stratford DLR, sorry, uh, station. The DLR? No, Stratford Rail, actually. You know, the kind of the Stratford International Station. So if you want to, if you know what that is, a little hub where there's a piano, there's a bar just in front of. Um, the little kiddie sort of like play area thing it's got a great little outside seating outside decks big massive windows nice comfy chairs and of course me in the corner playing some big beats i'll be there probably until 11 maybe till 12 if it goes well and yeah that's what i'm doing these coming fridays up until the end of june which should be good good opportunity for me to dance good opportunity for me to put my dj skills out on show and a good opportunity for you mofos out there to get yourself some craft beer enjoy the sun after work and just chill the f out so that's what i'm doing um anyway i'm um, going back to what i was saying so i ran five miles right five miles five miles last night um the whole plan to run five miles was very was uh, it, it, it kind of relied a lot on when my wireless headphones were going to get delivered to me i think i mentioned to you guys previously that i was looking to upgrade the headphones that i bought from amazon a while back um these empow flames i'm sure you've seen them reviewed by loads of different uh, people online like unbox therapy and a few other people who have reviewed these uh, 20 dollar 20 pound bluetooth wireless headphones there's a day you are there, right? They're, 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 kind of, they're like an Empower Flame sort of gaff, right? They're really cool, really nice, really good to use, really cheap, quali- or, well, cheap price, all right quality. Over time, they kind of died on me. I, I was, I was, I literally abused the f out of these, right? I use them every single day, especially going to the gym. They're perfect for me. They fit my ears really well. I love the little clip on on top. But another time, the quality kind of did disin- uh, disin- disintegrated. It, they disintegrated over time, sorry. And then I think I put them in my back pocket and I sat down somewhere on the bench and I kind of crushed one of the left earlobes. Um, and then over time, the quality of the sound wasn't that great. And it kind of, you know, there was no real noise uh, cancellation or sound isolation in that regard. So I thought I need to upgrade them. So I looked online and I was thinking, you know what? I'm not really ready yet to go and buy. Well, I'm, I'm ready, but I'm not really sure what I want to get yet. I want to see what these people say about the new Beats uh, headphones that are coming out at the moment. I want to see what the reviews are on those. But I also wasn't sure what to get uh, in between, right? Because I know I want to get the... Um, 
Um, I don't want to get the Bose, the, uh, the Bose that everyone has, the ones that are wireless, Bluetooth ones, they're really cool. I've got a friend that has them, I've tried them on, they sound fucking amazing. I know I want to get those for my daily commute, but I need something to work out in. I'm not really comfortable wearing um, massive over-the-ear DJ headphones because I, I tend to sweat quite a lot and that won't be good for me. So I need something that kind of props into my ears. So I looked online again and then I kind of stumbled upon this great, um, an, an upgrade to the Empower Flames that I have already, right? And I saw a couple of reviews and they were saying that the, the, the sound quality is a lot better on them. They, 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 um, they actually have some element of noise cancellation. I'm not sure if there's full noise cancellation, but they work a lot better than these. I can upgrade. So I decided to get them, and the whole five mile run was predicated on when my, my headphones get delivered. Unfortunately, they came super late. They didn't come at the time I thought it was going to come. I was working from home. They ended up arriving around, I'm going to say 7 p.m. So I ended up going for my run about 8. So super late for me, if you know um, how early I wake up and when I go to work out and stuff. I thought, you know what? Let me mix things up a good bit and go for a little evening run, a little five mile run. Um, but they arrived, right? And here they are, the Empower M8s. That's what they are, right? Empower M8s, as you can see there in the camera. So they're a little bit different design than the old ones that I have here. Well, let me get them up here so I can show you on the camera. If you're not watching via the YouTube app, via the YouTube video, then please apologize. I was just trying to describe as much as you can for them. So the, the first ones are just a standard kind of block rectangle kind of shape. No real ergonomic design to it. And the M M8s have sort of like upgraded a little bit. There's a little bit of a chamfer here. They've got a little bit more of a, I don't know, like a matty kind of finish on them. Um, the buttons also change, right? It's this weird little kind of like triangle button instead of the little round one before. Uh, and the earphones kind of fit you a bit better too. I'm not sure if it's, they've changed the diameter of the actual clip over, over the head, over the ear, sorry, but they fit a little bit snugger too. And they just, and they, the sound quality is far superior on these, far, far superior. And they're about the same price. I think they were like eighteen ninety nine um via Amazon Prime. So they, they arrived straight away and I just put, popped them out of the bag, chucked the box away. And then off I, off I went to go have my run, a little five mile run this evening. And it was really good, man. I, I enjoyed using them. You can change, but you can effectively change the songs or pause them. But you can play and pause by pressing the big button on the side. They've got a little volume control at the top of the right um one here as you can see maybe there a little a little nick there a little volume control up and down one 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 can skip one can go backwards and if you hold one i think it kind of fast forwards a little bit which is quite nice as well um you could obviously use it as a bluetooth headphones if someone wants to call you they've got a bit of a microphone there too so all in all perfect headphones so everything was going well everyone's going swimmingly there i am on my five mile run i'm now approaching around i'm at the probably the four mile mark just about to finish my last mile and as I'm approaching the Bow flyover, if you're familiar with East London, towards um, the one that's kind of like where the 24-hour McDonald's is, I'm running along, and then I pass this young young this young woman walking past on the side street, going kind of around her. So excuse me, because it's quite a narrow little pavement there next to the motorway. And then on my right hand side, just out of nowhere, this um, delivery driver courier um, crashes his motorbike in the inter like is it an intersection? I've got what it's called. You know when it's all like when the road peels off and it goes to a bridge and it goes down to the regular road. Whatever that kind of little triangle thing is in between the, the lines on the the bike, the the guy on the motorbike. I'm not sure if he was daydreaming or if he wasn't concentrating too much, but essentially he was riding really fast on the motorway and his back wheel gave out and he just ended up sliding across the whole entire floor, smashed on the floor. I um, mean, that smashed it. Of course, when he when he smashed on the floor, he busted his knee and he ended up scraping all along it and then I ended up fucking screaming, "Oh my god, shit!" Ended up running across and helping him out. I picked him up, picked up the bike, put it on the side, and then kind of made sure he sat down because he was a little bit uh, disorientated, disorientated, disoriented, 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 right? So I say it, right? Anyway, yeah. And then um, I ended up kind of helping him out um, and ended up calling the ambulance for him to get um, service. And shock horror, right? Um, the ambulance came super quick. I'm not sure if they always have like a because and again it was a it was a medic on the motorbike so like an ambulance or kind of a nurse or whatever I don't know if they are they nurses or medics I don't know he was on a motorbike so I'm assuming that flyover is probably fraught with accidents I'm assuming that area is kind of you know because I know when I used to commute to work um uh, on my bicycle it was one of the most scariest places to ride by like that kind of uh, bow flyover that was the most scariest bit and basically all the way up until Olga East that whole entire area is just like fraught with shitty drivers shitty cyclists shitty pedestrians everyone's 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 playing a part in in, in um in somehow putting your life in danger it's not even i can't even blame anyone do you know what i mean there's pedestrians that are closer like yeah you know what makes it even worse as you're just a passing bethnal green i think or something there's queen mary um university so it's, you know hundreds of students yeah all young um over over excited running around just living their life so they're all running around the streets 
Then around the corner, there's a skate park, right? The legendary skate park around the corner. So you see, you have a lot of skaters just like, you know, randomly jumping into the street and doing what they're doing. Then you have schools all, all around that area too. So parents of little children running around. Then you have loads of learner drivers. I think um, that's the place where if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna have your driving test, that's one place you won't want to have your, your your kind of actual driving test. You wouldn't want to have it there. I think it's probably only second to Apton Park, right? It's, it's it's where you go and fail your test for the most part. Um, so that happens, and then you have people like me on my bicycle trying to get to work, right? Um, not necessarily, you know, the best, not the most adept at kind of you know anticipating danger and just about you know everything's a shock. Everything's kind of like a last minute break. But of course, over time, as you get used to riding those kind of places, you start to kind of have a bit of a sixth sense of just, you know, okay, this guy's a psycho. She's not going to look up. Because before you get angry, you start telling people off, like, hey, look up. Stop looking at your phone crossing the road. Yeah, I mean, you start telling people off for a second. Then you realize, hold on, everyone's doing this. It's not just this one person. You're wasting your time. You're getting your blood pressure up for nothing. It's, if anything, try and avoid them. They're not going to try to avoid you. You try and avoid them. That's the main name of the game. So I ended up calling the ambulance and they came like, I don't know, in two seconds, man. So I think the guy was maybe. Because if I remember correctly, when I've, when I've been running that side of walk or, or, or cycling back home from Olga East, I do remember seeing a, quite a few, um, I, I, I thought they were just like traffic wardens. They'd make sure that, you know, again, I think it's health and safety or the safety of the bicyclists. Because sometimes the bicyclists that come by the M McDonald's um, flyover will try and burst through the lights and not stop at the traffic lights. So I think they would, there's always a police officer at the side there waiting and making sure people will stay at the lights and don't jump them and all that sort of stuff. I think especially during rush hour, because it was just before rush hour ended, um, which actually made the guy's accident a lot a lot more bearable for himself, actually, because, you know, he could have he could have got really fucked up. But luckily it wasn't during the, the really, really busy period of the rush hour time. It kind of like, you know... Huh? Uh, the traffic kind of died out. He kind of slid across the floor, and no one really hit him because that—that's usually where it kind of fucks up in it. Because when you're driving on a motorbike and a car's right behind you and you slide on the floor and it hasn't got any time to stop and it kind of you know accidentally clipped your you know runs over your leg or something that's when it can get a bit it can get a bit dicey so yeah i ended up putting ambulance room and they came straight away and then i ended up kind of proceeding along with my run again shook the guy's hand told him to take care end up running and yeah man five of my runs been, it's, been, it's been my longest run so far in a while i think maybe maybe in about four or five weeks um slow as fuck it hurt all the way through but Again, it's just another indication to me that this half marathon, this Hackney half marathon, I'll be able to do it. I'll be able to finish it for sure. But whether or not it'll be a good time, whether or not I'll look good doing it is another thing altogether. That's the way I'm kind of a bit nervous on it. And, I'm, and again, I shouldn't be worried about this sort of stuff because I'm doing it so late. Low is, um, I've only got three weeks, so I've got less than three weeks now until the race happens. But I do want to kind of give a good account of myself. I don't want to go there and just, you know, just fucking rein it in. I, would, I do want to try and get under two hours. That'd be awesome if I can do that. Um, obviously my fastest time is 147. I'm not going to finish that at all because, you know, I have, I'm not at the current optimal weight to do it at, but so far so good. Um, I'm eating relatively healthy at the moment. I'm sleeping quite well. I'm working out a lot. I'm kind of, again, I'm, I'm going by the plan I have in this book here. I'll show you. I've got in this book here, um, Unbreakable Runner by the one Brian McKenzie. He was the original founder of CrossFit Endurance or CrossFit Running. And um, essentially the workouts, like for instance, I'll give you a little brief um, idea on what I'll be doing. So to I think today or tomorrow I'll be doing five to six, 100, 1,000 meter repeats. So you do 30, 30 to 45 minute drills. The drills are stretches, they're little uh, runs, hop and skip, like lifting your leg up towards your bum, like loads of really cool drills actually. Let me see if I can find a picture of the drills. Drill. So these are some of, these are some of the exercises. Pulling wall. These are the drills, isn't it? Right? Are these the drills? Yeah, these are the drills. So the drills are hollow rock, hop forward with a lean, pulling wall, alternate foot pull, and fast runs. Um, you got the the drills there, as you can see, right? That hollow rock, um, hopping on one. So pretty um rudimentary stuff. I think if you're used to running and doing all that malarkey, you'll know how to do it. And then another one too as well on the wall here to make sure. You're getting the right strides that you're running. So it's all well and good. I think I'm on the right track. I just need to kind of, you know, con consistently keep running. It was probably a little bit late than I'd like to run yesterday night because effectively if I were to run early in the day, I would be able to run early in the morning again. It gives me time to recover. Like when you run so close to each other, like when you run so close, like when you're running super late at, the mo at night and doing it again in the morning, it really f ends up hurting. If anything, I probably should have gone to the gym this morning and done some strength workouts. But again, I don't want to do anything apart from running. I just want to run all the way through until I, r I do the race. I don't want to do, I don't want to lift the weight. The most I'm doing is 100 push-ups and sit-ups at home. That's enough to kind of keep my core up to par. But I don't want to do any deadlifts, no no squats, no nothing. I just want to run, 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 run until I get to my uh, race. That's actually what I've been doing. So yeah, I'm happy with these um, M8s. I recommend you check them out as well. Really good headphones. Um, They're pretty cool. 
uh, they fit really well. The sound is really good, impeccable sound, um, great connectivity for the most part. All you need to do is, you know, skip, play, pause, basic functions, all there, they work. What else is going to say to you guys? Oh, yeah, and about the date stuff, I'm really happy about this. You know, I, lo- I love listing my dates on Facebook. And I love listing my dates on Resident Advisor, which I'm going to do after I finish the podcast. It's just a really nice... um feeling right and looking back on some of the dates that i've done and how long i've been doing the djing thing maybe i think maybe it's coming up to 10 years now um consistently on my own it's probably been about three years but it's just nice you know to kind of see all your dates listed up what you're going to do where you're going where you've been previously um the experience that i'm gaining from it as well is kind of been invaluable i just need to kind of build on it and kind of get better i want to i want to be able to have like a an hour or two hour set that i know i can play anywhere that's going to kind of get the, the dance floor fucking jumping especially a generic kind of dance floor, especially um um and on back of that i was watching i think a couple of boy rooms last night too with some kids i was thinking yeah that's how it should be man you need to kind of you know be honing your craft again so yeah that's a good time it's a good time to be agostino right now Anyway, let's get into some topics because that's what we need to talk about right now, isn't it, right? No waffling needed. Let's get right into the topics. What have we got here? Mm-mm-mm-mm. She had to delete some of these stuff, isn't it? I've already talked, spoke about this. Okay, cool. Here we go. Oh, so um, uh, there was an article I saw on GQ about Virgil Abloh's Patek Philippe, right? I'm not really the biggest watch person. I don't know anything about watches. Don't get me wrong. I don't have any aspirations to get a really nice expensive watch. But this article is pretty interesting about um, how he customizes his watch and who was behind customizing it. Um, I think the only thing I know about Patek Philippe is um, the future song, right? Patek Philippe. Oh, two more sources. That's the only thing I know about um, a, a watch anyway from a rap, rap lyric. But um, yeah, so Virgil's got this particular watch that I think he debuted or he showed when he was showing off something to do with the DJ Jacks or something or whatever it may be. And GQ made a good little article about it. Now that I'm going to put up on screen and we're going to go through it. So um, this is the article from GQ magazine. It's called Virgil Abloh's, Virgil Abloh's uh, Abloh Size is One of a Kind Patek Philippe. And it's written by Cam War from GQ. And it says the following. Um, Virgil Abloh's story is one of taking pre-existing designs and giving it his own Abloh, Ablonian spin. At one of Virgil's first projects, Pirate Visions, he took a subpar. Okay, so let's skip that. The designer is a prolific collaborator too, tuning out, turning out glasses, water bottles, sneakers. Abloh can make it. So, okay, cool. Let's go. Both Patek Philippe and Virgil's camp de- de- declined to comment when asked about its origins last week. But over the weekend, I discovered a likely source. Watch customizer Mad Paris. The company's signature style design um, involve dressing watches up in matte black or in black sorry mad paris sprawling instagram features watch after watch that looks like it lost a fight to a squid while mad paris founder behe la rue um coily says over whatsapp i can either confirm or deny we made it for him followed by four smiley emojis he seems to know exactly how abloh's watch was made so this is the watch right that he made like oof, look how nice that looks right so it's entirely blacked out and then if you zoom in closer to it, at the Patek Philippe in the inside of it, it's got the infamous quotation marks either side of it. It looks fucking incredible. And again, it's a really um cool watch. I think um interesting maybe movement. Maybe it's just because it's a Virgil thing, and he's you know he's 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 uh, he's heavy in the design world. But it'd be interesting to see if like in the future or in you know in in maybe a couple of years, if the trend steers away from you know um what what do they call it? Busting down your watch when you kind of you know flood it with diamonds or or whatever it may be called. Um, that would be interesting to see if it moves away from that and it kind of gets into like, you know, maybe changing the colour, maybe, you know, recasting things. Like I saw some kid actually recently. Um, who was it? I saw a kid on YouTube who had that. Do you know the Elite chain with the with the belt buckle and the swoosh and the Elite 1970 with a dress thing has got in it? Some kid online on YouTube, I think, got that chain, which is, I think, cast in steel or something. And then you got another jeweler to remake the entire chain in sterling silver like insane right so just got the got the chain and somehow was able to recast all the links and all the elements all the little charms or whatever it may be called on it and redone it i think as well on top of that i think maybe ian connor's got that chain right and he's kind of busted down so i'm assuming they put diamonds all over i'm not sure how they do that um so it'd be cool to see if they kind of steer away from the whole diamonds exuberant flashy things and kind of steer towards the more like you know um bespoke luxury finish because to be honest this looks really expensive it's, there's no gold, there's no shiny bits on it, but it looks it looks dear, right? It, it doesn't look like a, 
I don't know, you know, like one of those watches that people buy when they listen to podcasts. I don't know what the names of them are, but it doesn't look like any of those, right? It looks fucking expensive. It looks dear as fuck. It looks really nice. Um, anyway, it continues. Um, the watches are one of a piece coat in coated in diamond like carbon. Wow. Look clear. Look closely into the darkness, and you see a pair of tiny quotation marks around the Patek Philippe logo, right underneath where the twelve o'clock indicator is typically found. Le Rue says the process of blacking this particular watch out took two months. First, we need to buy the watch, which is which I didn't know. I didn't think that was a thing because I, I think a lot of people do that in cost, sneaker customization, right? See customers. I remember. I think there was a period of sneaker customization where, for the most part, you'd go with them with your shoe and they do it for you. But I think nowadays they have to source the shoe. It's, it's a kind of full, it's kind of a front, to, it's kind of a full full pack service, right? From the beginning to the end, they'll source the shoe for you or get a shoe that's more, you know, that's more applicable to the design that you want and then kind of build it from the ground up. I'm assuming that's what they do. And it's probably the same sort of thing, right? You kind of disassemble it for its components and then you kind of put it together. Because again, in the beginning, there was a period of time where people were just like, they'll place the bits of material on top of the actual original material. But I think some of the best sneaker customers, pro- seeker customizer, probably replace the panels right they're full-on cutting and sewing the entire thing which is an insane endeavor to do but again this is why the internet is amazing because you can find these people out there and if you have the funds and you have the time they can make the thing for you um blacking it out first they've got to find the watch it's not super easy these days larue explains the watch it would take philippe natulius 5726 with an annual calendar alone costs forty five thousand dollars after LaRue can get his hands on the nearly 50 grand piece, it goes into the Mind Paris workshop where it's completely dissembled. This is the only way to ensure every nook and cranny of the watch is, is uh, voided of color. Those small pieces then use, they need to be washed, polished, brushed, or sandblasted before they're coated. Yeah, that's true, because I remember there was a period in time when I wanted to get a fixie bike, and I remember there was a particular place, I forgot what it was, where they used to do the, they used to be able to, they would, um, they could spray paint or they could paint your frame, right? In whatever color you wanted, right? And it was, you know, the, the obviously the prices were, you know, astronomical, but they could do a really good finish about it for it and the whole entire premise of it. But one of the requirements was that you had to disassemble your bike. And I remember, you know, I was, you know, I'm not the most adept at fixing bikes myself or building them from the ground up. And I, that's, where, that's where I kind of stopped. That was my stumbling block. But I remember that being a big thing. And I remember thinking, well, why, was that, why is that such a big issue? And you just spray paint the bike. It's, you know, same thing I used to do back in the ends. Remember when you used to nick a bike back in the ends and you used to spray paint it orange? Like, we can tell you nicked it. Like, Jeremy, you know I mean? it's not hiding the bag. Everyone used to do it back in the day. It's fucking horrible. You buy spray paint from a fucking pound shop, like really blotchy, like shitty things. Like, you know, you don't even stand down the frame. It's just like, you know, it's covered in it's horrible. But then when you saw when somebody actually dissembled their bag and gave it to them and actually sprayed the frame properly, or you went online and you saw how they actually how they actually respray cars properly, like frames something like, oh, that's why they went to take disassemble it. The finish is impeccable. So I can only imagine how much work it must take to disassemble a watch that doesn't necessarily want to be disassembled, right? They sort of like hide all the nooks, they hide all the all the bits and pieces that kind of allow it to be disassembled so it kind of looks flush, looks like it just came out of the fucking computer, it's assembled. But obviously it hasn't been, but yeah, that looks cool. <laughs> Uh, the fun starts all the, the fun starts once all the pieces are broken down. They go into a specialized vacuum chamber. The handles of the coating pro, handling handles the coating process like an easy bake oven for high end watches. After preheating, a gas is released into the chamber that covers the pieces in watching completely. The process has a very cool name that doubles as a moniker of my favorite future hardcore band, Ionic Pulverization. After the pieces are coated, the watch is put back together again by hand. In special cases, the watch's dials is customized with Ablo with Ablo's watch. Some mystery still remains of the final step. When I asked how the work question marks are made, Lou simply sends back, who knows? Wow, super cool. And then I've got the actual guy's um, Instagram here as well. You can actually check it out and see what he's doing. Mad Paris Workshop. But yeah, that's that's super cool. I think that, that that's what I would do, especially if Protect Philippe came up and I don't know. Imagine if they gifted Virgil Abloh that watch, right? And it was a kind of gift they kind of gave him and said, hey, we think you're cool. We think what you're doing is interesting. Uh, and that's the first thing I would do. I will just get fucking one of those watches and just completely black it out, make it look amazing. Or if, if anything, maybe black it out and have like a nice gold rim or silver rim outside of it. I'll make it super cool. And the actual watch style. Actually, there's one here that's, that looks like it. Um, Not this one. Let's put it on the screen. So this is a, what is this one? A deep sea. Wow. Black and green deep sea. That looks fucking beautiful. The dials are green. That that looks incredible. These are awesome. And these are the kind of watches that Rolex are probably not going to make in these sort of colorways, right? They're a little bit too garish for Rolex, I'm assuming. 
But I'm, I'm not sure. I, I wonder what um, watch enthusiasts watch enthusiasts think of these kind of watches. Do they like them? Is this kind of a spit in the face for the watch community? Do they like, oh, this is like you know selling ourselves out. It's cheapening the product, or do they think it's like you know the ultimate sign of a not even a flex, the ultimate sign of ownership? Because you're not going to resell this, right? Because when you see John Mayer talking about his Rolex watches, he's got loads of vintage. Uh, watches that he's kind of collected over time that you know there's some of them still have the original packaging or receipts and shit so you can resell that easily but these you can't probably resell in it i'd assume it's like it's like uh buying a lamborghini and getting it again spray painting it you know i don't know a particular color it's kind of you know you're cheaper in value but you're also confirming to people that you want to keep this car forever so i'm assuming the same thing with the watches right because not a lot of people would want a black and green rolex deep sea would they i would assume so anyway oh another one oh this is awesome man look at that matte finish wow customized deep sea military gray coating matte finish with a customized dial that looks beautiful and then there's this one that i would probably get in this sort of like that yeah that's what this one i would get a customized miller what's that mill Gauss. a customized rolex mill Gauss, right milgus milgus marble micro hand painted glossy finish look at that it's got a little electric got a little thunderstorm thing on the side each piece is a unique pattern that is fucking awesome i would get that in my eye. that was something i'd get i wouldn't want a mad custom written on the side of the dial though but i'd get that but i don't know are people do people like watches without the dial i would probably want numbers on it like maybe just 12 maybe just six three and nine i want to have some form of numbers on it i don't really i'm not sure if i like the kind of you know completely uh blank no numbers on it thing that's weird that looks more like a jewelry piece i actually want to tell the time on it or just go just give me the dials fuck it just give me all the dials on it I don't want anything else. I'm talking about stuff like I'm going to get one. You know what I mean? 30 grand, man. You know what I mean? One watch is what I fucking earn in a year. That's insane. <laughs> Isn't it? You put it to this perspective here. People are spending a, on a watch what I actually earn in a year. Like, that is nuts. But yeah, um, great little watches for Mad Paris. I recommend you check it out. I'll put the link of the Instagram in the show notes so you guys can see it for yourself. If you're that way inclined, if you're in the mood for some watches. What else we have here? What else is on a list of things to speak about? Bada, 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 bum. Something in the water wash out. This is a bit sad, isn't it, right? So something in the water, the festival from the one and only Pharrell Williams, my idol, someone that's been a huge inspiration to me, um, culturally, musically, whatever it may be called, someone that I'm a big, 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 big fan of, um, did a festival over the week, over the last couple of weekends, actually, I think so, recently, just after Coachella, that was amazing, sick lineup, it was hosted in Virginia Beach, where he's kind of from, in Virginia, essentially, so it's not in the most, you know, the most happening, glitzy area of the world, he kind of went to give something back to a community that kind of gave so much to him, but unfortunately, I think the last couple of days were completely washed out, right, the weather went, the weather was super shit, and they couldn't guarantee the safety of the attendees, so they had to cancel it. It's a little news report that kind of speaks about it. And then we're going to speak about it ourselves. I think this is a local Virginia Beach um, station, right? I'm assuming. So where's this from? 13 News Now. Let's play this now. Let's play this now, no pun intended. And go from well, there. you don't have to go far to the oceanfront to find some angry people. Yeah, weeks of planning, lots of anticipation, washed out by rain. Robert Boyd's live for us tonight at 17th in the boardwalk. And they're getting a little bit of a break, though, right? Oh, bless them. A little bit. I mean, the rain has started to come down in the last uh, 20 minutes or so. And a lot of people you're seeing walking back and forth Atlantic Avenue behind me, well, they really wish they were out on the beach enjoying uh, some of that fantastic music. But, of course, it wasn't meant to be Mother Nature and other uh, Yeah, that's always sad, isn't it, when you get the so festival and it does that, right? It washes up. And in a very disappointing fashion. Now, a lot of concert goers we spoke with said they don't necessarily really not at all blame Pharrell. You can't blame Pharrell. It's the yeah. weather. But what they do blame is they say uh, this the disorganization of the whole event when it came to alerting them about the concert being canceled. I don't know why they would cancel. Oh, I love his t shirt, man. I need to get reimbursed. Got people standing and waiting in line. Took, took days off of work and school to be here. Damn. And we had to miss a whole day. Even some of Pharrell's biggest fans were turning on the local music legend today. They say his team should have been more prepared in case weather moved in. Yeah. It's a little disappointing how nobody was getting alerts or anything, and then out of nowhere they just say it's canceled. Justin Speaker is relieved that he will at least be getting reimbursed for the lost day. It's a little bit of money that we kind of lost out on. We paid for a three-day pass, not a two-day pass. You know what I'm saying? Anaya Johnson feels like she was lied to. The website says, rain or shine. She bought a poncho. So where is the music? I'm calling for the 260 is a lot of money. So some people would have been happy. Again, I think it's a it's a it's a natural consequence of the fire festival, you know. I think fire festival. And I'm I'm I'm. No, it's a joke, but I'm being serious. I think fire festival, the fucking backlash at Tanacon, 
and the foozy thing that he was doing, right? I think there is a there is an understanding, like, and those things are really damaged reputation. You can't I, I, again. I, I think Tanner will probably argue against it, and I'm sure Fuzzy will too. But I don't think they could argue that their reputations took a real big dent off the back of those really abysmally organized um, events. I think people now are very aware and awake of just what how much goes into putting on a good event, what effort, what planning is needed, forecasting ahead of time. So for somebody like a YouTuber to just decide, you know, I, I don't know, on the whim to kind of put on an event to host thousands of their fans and think they're going to smash it is probably a little bit naive. Um, but I think because of the backlash that these guys received, I think some planners just don't want to take any chances. They're like, you know what? Fuck this. We're not taking any chances. If it's not going to work out, I'd rather cancel it and get the backlash and refund people as opposed to put it on and do it that way. And I know from my experience in the electronic music scene, especially in London, there was a period of time where a lot of event planners, a lot of promoters were doing the same sort of thing too. Um, they were putting events, the sound wasn't working out well or the toilets weren't working, the bars were too packed. And essentially, they just end up refunding everyone just to kind of like, you know, make sure, hey, we're, we're sorry this happened, we refund everybody, which probably hurt them a lot. And most of these promoters probably didn't end up bouncing back. But I think in terms of reputation, the one thing that you can't do is damage your name. It's cheapening your name by putting on the subpar product. You'd rather cancel the event, refund all your attendees and say, hey, we're sorry. It's the first year. Again, first year of festivals, like I mentioned the other day about my Hackney Half Marathon, the first year the Hackney Half Marathon was incredibly shit, right? Really badly organized. It was probably one of the, it wasn't their fault too because it coincided with it being one of the hottest summers of recent histories, right? Um, it's uh, I've mentioned it previously before. There's no real tall buildings around that Hackney area where they do the marathon at, especially around Stratford, uh, the Victoria Park and that, whatever it's called. So there's no, it's all kind of, you know, open and clear so when the sun's beating down that tarmac you're getting hit everywhere every single angle you're getting hit and there's no shade whatsoever it doesn't exist so um we're running around there weren't enough water stations to cut to kind of you know accommodate for that and people were just not used to running in that kind of heat before it's just one of them things isn't it? if you're running um again because i'm one of the people that doesn't run i don't run with water because i get stitches i'm sure people get the same sort of thing too a lot of people are like that too so you run on empty you're already a little bit dizzy and disoriented anyway from the workout you know all the blood's rushing around your body and shit it's not the best conditions people were fainting from heat stroke all over the place some of it from just fatigue and from heat stroke too and they didn't really have the resources on hand to kind of um, help or accommodate for those um, potential haphazards. But in the next couple of years after, it was improved a lot. They kind of over, they kind of over egged the water station. Then they kind of knew how to rein it in. Then they got those little jet stream things. It's a kind of a thing you have to work out over time. But again, I think I'd much prefer it if I was for real to kind of make sure I cancel it and just kind of redo it again next year. Money back, bro. Talk to me. We need cash. Period. <laughs> Yeah, I got a feel for them, man. People also say when the city requests that you ride your bike and you do it even in a rainstorm, only to have them cancel on you last minute, it's a frustrating feeling. We rode our bikes a lot of blocks to get here mm. um, in the wind, <laughs> so we're a bit disappointed. Now, yeah, you really can't blame Pharrell too much because he stepped up, him and his uh, festival organizer stepped up right away, probably within an hour after the concert tonight was canceled and said, listen, everybody with wristbands that would have paid their money will get reimbursed for one day. Mm. So they did step up and say that. So anybody That's who cool. buy the pass, now you just got to wait in the mail and the email, uh, and the email will give you the full directions of how to get that reimbursement so you will get some of your money back. What? That's okay though. I think in the end they got some of them get their money back again. I just think it's it's nature of the game, right? Uh, if you go to these kind of festivals, the first ones are always going to be shit. But you want to be part of history. You want to be one of the people to say you were there first. Looking at the people that attended, looking at all the guests he had on there, from Jay Z to Tyler to X X whatever whoever person it may have been, it looked like a fucking fully fully stacked festival. Like he went over and above um, with that lineup, and people really flew in from all different parts of the country to come and see you know this legendary festival kick off. And somebody you know who's a huge collaborator, and you could only you can only imagine what it's going to be like next year, right? Imagine the likes of Beyonce and all these kind of people attending his event you know he's produced for some of the biggest stars that we know um he has you know he has probably the richest musical palette of anyone involved in hip-hop right he can he can legitimately put on you know country music stars and no one would kind of be a guest at seeing them on the stage it's generally a good concert i'm sure the same sort of thing happened for golf wang festival too flog flog now can't flog now right 
It was a bit shitty the first time around, and it got better over time too. So it happens, and it happens. I think that's part of the festival experience. You got to kind of chalk it up to you know first round jitters, and then hopefully over time it'll get better and better. They'll get more sponsorship. They'll get more help with production. Uh, it's a proof of concept. It's shown that it's worked. It showed he'd be able. He's you, you, he's, he's able to illustrate. I could get these people to come to Virginia Beach and hang out at this festival, right? A place that isn't you know the glitz and glamour of LA or New York, or whatever it may be. So the proof of concept has been proved. So let's give it. Let, let, let's give him time, and hopefully he gets it right the next time round. What else are we going to put on here? What else is on the list here? What else? What else? What else? iPhone sales are dropping at record pace. Ooh, ah, ah. This was bound to happen, right? This was bound to happen. So this article from the BBC that says iPhone sales are dropping like a fucking brick. Because that's the thing they always used to brag about within their investor meetings, right? Um, Tim Cook would be on the phone talking to the investors or people from the board saying, you know, how well they're doing, how many phones they're selling, blah, 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 blah. Um, the iPhone was probably essentially the only product in the Apple lineup that's it's essentially making them big bucks, right? I would assume, right? No, maybe? I don't know. Anyway, this article here from from BBC will shed more light onto it. So the t- title is iPhones, Apple's iPhone sales drop at record pace. And the article says as follows. Um, the sales of iPhones fell, did, 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 zoom in a bit here, fell at their steepest ever rate according to data from the three months uh, to the end, for, according to data for the three months to the end of March. The firm said revenue from the iPhone dropped by 17% compared to the same period last year to 31 billion, which is, you know, still not a pretty penny. Uh, however, Apple chief executive Tim Cook said sales were stronger towards the end of the March, including China, where it cut iPhone prices to boost demand. Apple lifted this outlook um, for the future for the three months in June that sent shares that sent shares more than three hours on the trade. iPhone sales falling in US billions by quarter. So as you can see over time, they're falling down, 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 down. The company had warned of slowing iPhone sales earlier this year, especially in China where Apple competes with cheaper rivals such as Huawei Technologies and Xiaomi. Yeah, of course, uh, a lot of those people use those, a lot of people from those kind of places use phones as like that. Apple doesn't really have the same sort of cachet or brilliance as it once had in the past. But Mr. Cook said, uh, price adjustments in China, lower Chinese taxes on iPhones, and new trading and financing deals help sales start to recover towards the end of the quarter. But they're, they're doing it. There's a lot. That's a lot of dancing they're having to do capture sales. That's something you wouldn't expect Apple to have done in the past, right? Cut prices, trading, finance options. Those are things you're not expecting to do before because the phone just sold itself. Um, he also credits his improving demand for products such as Apple Watch along with the progress of US China trading talks. I don't think that's true. Um, the trade relationship versus the previous quarter is better. The tone is better, Mr. Cook said. The sum of all the together has helped us. Apple has lifted its guidance for the third quarter. For the three months of March, total sales hit 58 billion compared to the analyst estimates of 57. However, that is a below the sales target of 61 in the quarter first, in the second quarter of last year. Um so yeah, I'm not surprised really. Again, for just my for just my um amateur novice, you know, un- uninformed opinion looking from the outside in, it makes complete sense. If you go to any kind of big YouTube big gadget YouTuber um and you check the phones that they're reviewing, there's an increase, real real increase in phones that aren't Apple being reviewed by these people because essentially the companies are making more phones and they're sending them out and kind of getting them out to the masses. And there was a point in time where uh, you watch a review, especially of, a Mark, uh, of Marcus Brownlee, and whenever he'd compare a, smart, a smartphone to an Apple device, you'd say, oh, still, the Apple device is like a much better all-round phone, right? Um, this other phone, whether it's uh, Samsung, whatever it may be called, has this, be- has this, this feature is better, this feature is better, but as an overall product, the Apple still kind of reigns supreme. But I've noticed over time the trend has kind of uh, has kind of happened where I've noticed they're mentioning phones that are just good all round phones and good alternatives to Apple products. If you're not bothered about having Apple products, which most people aren't, if you don't have an Apple computer or you're just not bothered about using iTunes or you don't want to be in a walled garden, whatever it may be called, you won't be that resistant to kind of like trying out a new Samsung or Hawaii or Waii, Waii, whatever they're called, hey, or OnePlus phone or whatever, may, or Google and Amazon, Amazon phone when they relaunch those again. Are they going to relaunch those? Maybe they will. I don't know. But you're not really bothered. Essentially, you're not bothered about the hardware. What you want is just the ability to post pictures on social media, take selfies with your friends, record a video, scroll on social media itself. Do you know what I mean? That's all you want. You would, the hardware isn't that important to you, what the actual phone, who actually makes the phone. Um, and the only really big technological leap that I've seen people get really excited about, something that I didn't get, and it's still not something that I really understand why people love it so much, is the foldable phone, right? That, that um, foldable phone that got recalled recently. 
But for the most part, in terms of smartphones, it seems like everyone's caught up because Apple has stopped. They stopped innovating. It seemed like it seemed like um maybe since the app iPhone six, every phone hasn't really no phone has really blown you away so far. Maybe even the app the iPhone five. You know, I'm not too sure. Maybe that that'll be the one. I was like, whoa. Um, they've all just been kind of the same iterations of the phone. They're kind of getting a bit thinner. They're trying to make them bezel-less. Uh, they're taking away the butt, they're taking away the home button. They've made that just one big screen. They've trying to improve the camera here and there. But there's not been really big, any big, real big um, re- evolution in the actual overall phone design. So phones, companies have been able to catch up and refine it and make their own kind of style. Because remember, there was a period of time too when all Samsung's look at af- iPhones. Now, for sure, most Samsungs don't look at iPhones. You can tell the difference, whether it's a curved screen, whether it's a size, whether it's where the camera's placed, whether it's the lack of chin, bezel. There's little things that you can tell are different from the actual iPhone. So I think it's essentially been Apple's... They they fumbled the ball, really, isn't it? They were... Essentially, they were clear on goal. They had an open net, and they basically, you know, passed it just wide outside the post. So they basically fucked up for themselves and allowed the other competition to kind of get in and kind of steal a march on them. So it's interesting to see what they do in the future. I'm still, I still, you know, I'll still cast myself as a bit of an Apple fanboy, but I'm still open to buying other products. So I'm interested to see how they develop, how they step up to the challenge. And instead of cutting prices and adding trading deals, just make a phone that's really you know, covetable, that has features that no one else can really play with, right? Even that camera feature that I thought everyone would be creaming themselves over. Another one on the app on the iPhone X, the iPhone 10, the one that kind of allows you to do depth of field. It kind of um, puts your face in focus and lets everything else be blurry. I thought that would be the thing that would be, you know, really sell it. But I think for the most part, people have apps nowadays so that can probably do that feature, right? That can actually blur the background and make your face pop up. Like, sure, but if you want to take, um, um, if you want to take what are those shots is it camera what, what are they called what are the shots called when you're acting and, you go, and, and they give you pictures so you can take into bookings and castings and shit anyway whatever it may be called those kind of you know really nice black and white kind of you know ranking style uh, portrait shots i thought that would be the main selling point of it but i guess people don't really care for the most part again like i can't mention i think people for the most part just want a smartphone that works with a great camera and they can use social media on and that's about it for the most part so let's see what happens with apple can they step up to a challenge can they steal a march and get those sales back up where they need to be or is it or it or are apple doomed and essentially will they just have to start you know making loads of other shit like apple watches and maybe a tv maybe the streaming platform might be a real big earner for them um again because even a laptop is a, is a thing people are annoyed about even the imac right there's a lot of people online um, aren't really happy about the, the specs for the iMac, new imac coming out um or the apple mini the kind of little computer thing that you kind of that you kind of plug all your little pieces into um there's loads of things they haven't done really well and they haven't never made a printer too something i've always kind of wondered like at least you make probably a lot of good money on if they actually made a real good printer that you could just you know you could use your phone and print a boarding pass on or you could whatever you could plug it to any computer that'd be awesome maybe no one wants to make printers anymore i wonder why maybe it's a wastage or sustainability thing but no one wants to make an actual good printer that can actually work that works without you know that works without you using a manual you just pick it up put it next to a computer it connects and you can start printing um like that straight away no one does that but i wonder why maybe there's a smart people i don't know why they're not doing it but anyway that's it apple's cells are dipping 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 from 51 billion to 31 billion oh no <laughs> uh what else is on here let's look at else on the list cash machines are disappearing too everything's disappearing what's happening to the world man there's another article from the bbc it says free cash machines are disappearing all over the high street what is going on um the article says as follows uh free to use cash machines have been disappearing at a rapid rate across the uk according to a study by which uh nearly 1700 machines started charging for withdrawals in the first three months of the year with the majority starting to charge in march according to the consumer lobby group uh cardtronics which runs most of these and fellow provider note machine you could obviously tell what kind of companies they are they didn't even try to make an inventive forward thinking and brand name in it cardtronics and note machine i wonder what they do <laughs> are both likely to charge at more at more machines this could mean the country losing 13 percent of its free ntms in only a few months the charges come after reductions in the fee operators received from banks each time the atm is used um, link which oversees atms began to cut the fee known as the intercharge rate last year so far it's reduced the charge from 25 to 23p link said that at the time the move was aimed at protecting the atm network it left the fee 
for free to use ATMs which are a one kilometer or more from the next nearest cash machines unchanged. That's weird. So they cut the fee and then these things are taken away the machine. Well, I don't know about you guys, but my behavior with cash machines is sort of like the only time I actually take money out to buy things is when I'm going to go to a bar or go on a night out. Because I'm such a night freak and I love the nightlife and I love going out and partying and having a good time, um, I'm also very cognitive of uh, providing a good atmosphere or platform for everyone to have a good time too. So I'm very, uh, uh, probably, probably to a fault, right? I care too much about what other people are doing and how much fun they're having and making sure everyone's having a good time. So when I go out, I usually try and take out cash so I can have a bit of money left over so I can tip the bartenders, right? It's a bit silly because in East London, no one, no one tips anybody. Everyone's a struggling artist. Everyone's freelancing. Everyone's poor. No one gives the, the bartender any bits of money. Everyone's essentially people at the bar literally counting their pennies to get a drink, or they're smuggling drinks in to drink it at the bar or inside the bar somewhere in secret. So I'm I'm a bit of a unicorn that way, and it probably is a bit wasted uh, for the most part because I'm the only one giving them tips. But you know I like doing it anyway, regardless. So um. That's in terms I get cash. The other time as well, actually, I've just remembered is when I'm getting a haircut. For the most part, most barbers in the ends don't really have any. There's a couple I've I've seen uh, that have the little Izetto machine that you can, you know, uh, what you call it. Um, you can put your chip and pin. You can chip and pin on there, or you can do contactless pay with. But for the most part, everyone always accepts cash, so I have to always take out, you know, twenty quid or whatever it might be, whatever the price might be for the actual haircut, and then I just give them the whole twenty and live them as a tip. And that's the only times I actually use cash for the most part. Only times when I'm going to get a haircut or when I'm going out to a bar because I want to use, you know, I want to give them cash so I can have, or at least uh, if I don't take out all my money, and if I don't take out a whole 50 pound to go out for a night out, I might take out 20 and then have that and then just use that and then kind of use my card after I finish that regard. But that's the only times I have cash. I'm sure people are the same. Or maybe if you're, the other point you might need cash sometimes is if you're, um, if you're a smoker like I am, and you want to buy some rolling papers or you want to buy I don't know, a pack of cigarettes. You don't necessarily always want to be paying it with your card at a local off license because sometimes they charge you 50p, two pounds, depending on where you are. Yeah, I've seen a place for two pounds, especially in Vauxhall. There's off license that was charging you two pound fee for every car transaction over five pound, which is fucking nuts. Um, they don't say it's anything under five and it's two of it. So it's just a lot of money. So again, I'm not too sure if this is a kind of move towards people. There's less people using cash machines, but I think if you come to Stratford in the area that I live in, there's always a queue at cash machine. There's always people using it. We've got cash machines all across, fucking covering the entire of Stratford. We've got loads inside Stratford Station. We've got loads outside station in the um, where the McDonald's is on the other on the other side where the Subway and Burger King is. We've got loads at the station. We've got probably I don't know, yeah, maybe close to twenty cash machines in that one area. Yeah, we've got loads at the station itself. We've got loads in Westfield Shopping Centre, of course, because there's banks downstairs. We're covered in we're covered in cash machines, but there are those places that exist in London that are complete dead spot centre for cash machines. So, again, I'm not sure why that is. Towns struggling with a cash machine shortage. There are towns outside of London that are struggling. Dr. Continue says, Ashley Cooper from um, Hebden Bridge in West Yorkshire has seen the number of cash machines dwindle over from six down to two. Imagine the whole fucking area, you've got two cash machines. Bloody hell. It causes real problems, especially on bank holidays. There are no banks here anywhere. We have a mobile bank that visits every few weeks, but that's no good to me. Mobile bank, what does that do? Like on the what? In an actual little coach? A little kind of, in a what? In a, in a poor cabin? That's bizarre, isn't it? I'm not freaking, that doesn't sound safe to me. Hebden Bridge is quite a touristy area, I'd assume so. But part of West Yorkshire looks very um, picturesque. Um... Uh, it's quite a touristy area and there's usually a problem with one cash machine going out of order because it's run out of cash is that what happens i didn't know that you know so they don't, they don't have a an, uh, they don't have an uh, an image or a, a, a screen that says out of cash whenever it's out of cash it just means out whenever it says out of order it just means out of cash i didn't know that huh that's weird isn't it? why, why didn't you just say out of cash or is the, or they don't want to give the indication there's money in there we know there's money in there like just say it's out of cash. I don't know. Weird. Um, the local cinema here always has a cash business. Always uh, is always a cash business, but they are now having to accept digital payments or lose punters. For me, it's likely. How do you have a, a cinema that doesn't accept card? That's crazy, isn't it? This is in 1975. I don't remember. When was the last time you give money to somebody at a cinema? Oh, when I went to cinema actually the other day to watch Avengers. Jesus Christ, man! Got a, a massive tub of a massive uh, cup of a massive uh, you know, um, Fanta that I was going to supplement with a bottle of whiskey that I might have not or did not bring, I don't know, allegedly brought in the cinema, snuck it in myself. Uh, I was going to put that in there. And then I ended up getting the mug, the kind of, the, the drink itself. Number one is from a tap, so it's obviously flat as fuck. And number two, there's no ice. Imagine going to a cinema 
get a drink and there's no ice. No ice. The local cinema here always, uh, for me, is quite, it's going back to the dark ages, it's crazy. Um, ATM operators receive an interchange fee with a bank machine every time someone uses the machine. Note machine, which operates 7,000 cash machines across the UK, said the cut in the interchange rate meant it was considering introducing fees of up to four, of up, up to four, 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 five, four thousand of them. Um, unless urgent action is taken to reduce the pressure on ATM operators by reversing the interchange fee reductions, Note machine will be forced to begin of converting ATMs to sur sur surcharging, which is anywhere between. I've seen the cheapest I've probably seen is one pound twenty five, and the highest I've seen is probably about three seventy five. Again, I'll be more than happy if they keep the cash machine, but then make some pay, make some not pay for convenience, because I know some people would would just take the fee. I know I have myself. Even if a cash machine is like a hundred meters down the road, I'm not going to bother walking, especially if you're like you know you're getting a cash machine, you're getting a cash because you got imagine you went to like a I don't know an Asian restaurant somewhere, which some of them don't accept cash. So they don't accept card. You needed the cash, and you know your friends are waiting for you to pay the bill, so you can go out. You don't want to be walking around the entire area looking for a free cash machine to kind of sky off two pound fifty. Just pay the fee and just you know um, uh, fix it when you get back home, whatever maybe. Because so I would be more than happy with them introducing a fee and then having a cash machine still available. But yeah, um, this is a very very interesting case. And again, I'm not sure what people's behaviors are. I know in Scandinavia they've kind of they they want to. I think by 2020, right? They want to make it a completely cashless. Um, society i think it might be stockholm completely cashless city for the most part everywhere it only accepts contactless pay again maybe a safety thing because it means like you know no one can essentially rob you because you know you don't really have any cash on hand um maybe it's a convenience thing too it kind of allows uh, again oh it's better for me too imagine if i was working in the shop again i could and it was only cashless uh, uh till that'd be awesome that's one thing i struggled with so badly when i used to be um a supervisor at a retailer, a retail shop, or whatever you call it. I used to work as a sales assistant or I used to help out cashing up. That was a thing that fucking gave me, you know, it still gives me PTSD to this day because I'm shit with numbers anyway, right? I was horrible at maths growing up, like one of the worst, I, you know, from, from, you know, the first exam you do when you're like in primary school, I got like a three or two in maths. I got five, four, three. I'm pretty sure five in English, four in, no, five in art, four in English, no, five in English, four in science, and then three in maths. I like completely flunked maths. It never got better as uh, um, over time too. I was always in the foundation class in my um, maths classes growing up. So it never improved. I just generally kind of hated being in maths class. It was just one of the things that always kind of made me scared and worried. I used to get nervous, get a little panic attacks before I go to a classroom. And then imagine growing up and then working in a retail shop and then all of a sudden you've got this, you know, important job. You're the key holder. You're doing the rotors. And then all of a sudden you have to cash up at the end of the day. It used to take me hours, hours to cash up, like so long to cash up, really long. I'd have to make sure. Do you remember, have you ever been past a shop when it's closed and, and they're cashing up? There's people dancing around, cleaning the cleaning the cabinets, um, uh, put getting the standards in place, hoovering. Someone's playing music, they're singing along, cashing up. I couldn't do that. I'd have to I'd have to chuck everyone out of the shop. Okay, everyone go home, and I have to like meticulously like be counting, really concentrating, making sure I'm not fucking up. I don't want to make any mistakes because the worst thing is ever is wake up in the morning and get that dreaded text from your manager saying, "Oh, you fucked something up." It's like, oh. Jeremy, you know I mean? so you wanted to make sure you did it. And I used to always fuck it up, man. I was so bad at that. And even till now, like any job that requires me to have concentration, I always kind of flounder. My mind's always kind of racing around with different things. It's not necessarily me being distracted. I just, my mind's just somewhere else. That's why I probably think I could never be a professional goalkeeper. Probably one position on the pitch I would always fuck up on, a goalkeeper. Because there'll be times where I'll just be thinking, I'll be standing there thinking, oh, did I leave the, the, the cooker on? And all of a sudden, you know, there's a guy running in front of me, kind of, you know, uh, slotting a ball between my legs, you know what I mean? I could never be a goalkeeper. That that kind of focus that's needed to kind of really be on top of things is not one of my fortes. But yeah, <sighs> fucking, I hated math so much. I hated math so much, man. <laughs> what an absolute horrible time to be alive. Maths classes. Um, what else I wanted to talk about here? Oh, the pull up, the pull up, the pull up suitcase. Do you guys like this sort of stuff? I'm not sure if you're fans of this. Um, I know I am. I love these little Kickstarter things. Um, I have a little bit. Of, I, I've had a bad experience. I worked for a Kickstarter that was, you know, complete garbage, and they, you know, they went about. F it's it's a kind of a cultural thing. It's not the company's fault. Um, for the most part, Kickstarter is a platform where you know people tend to take the piss out of the customers. If you don't know about Kickstarter, it's a platform where you can essentially crowdsource and raise capital for an invention or product that you want to put out there. 
they're now kind of go gearing towards outside of kind of physical products they're going into documentaries films whatever they may be called um and it's a place for inventors product designers to kind of flesh out ideas get um see them ready for market see if there's a demand for it and over time you can you know raise capital for it and kind of get it into manufacturing and the whole idea is that you introduce tiers of backing so it's sort of like patreon where people can invest five dollars into an item and maybe get um, alerted when they first become available in the first run is and then maybe it's ten dollars is allows you to get a t-shirt and it goes up in tiers until you can kind of you know, go to the top level which essentially guarantees you the actual item itself um this is a luggage i've seen featured i think i might see on hype piece or somewhere else and um, it's the first suitcase that turns into a mob mobile closet i think it's called the pull-up or something similar to that kind of malarkey it's here on the screen we'll play the video in a minute but i just wanted to show you what it looks like um at the moment the goal rate is quite close right i think it's like um it's twelve thousand dollars is the goal and at the moment they've raised six thousand so they're just just over halfway um the first suitcase that turns into a mobile closet the all-in-one suitcase to avoid a uh, chaos sophisticated tidy and aesthetic designed in and engineered in germany um the tiers are here right what they got here yeah so they got tiers so they got um 15 dollar pledge a jigsaw puzzle pull-up comics 15 piece jigsaw puzzle thank you for your support awesome you pledge four fat four four fat 430 euros and you get a super early bird pull-up in black and 50 percent of retail value which is 800 dollars wow 800 dollars for a suitcase that is insane pledge 430 or more and you get super early super early bird in red you get in blue and it goes up already in ratings but let's watch the video because you can hear what this whole thing is about i quite like it again maybe these things are people are a bit over kickstart of things but they still get me man i still like you remember that um that cooler that played um songs and shit that epic fucking company that ended up failing it was an amazing little cooler that you could take to the park with you with your friends it had like a bluetooth speaker on it it had um a charging dock for your phone you could call your drinks in it had really chunky wheels it looked incredible but they couldn't really get it to market and it kind of failed Maybe it did get to market, it just didn't sell that well. But it was a really incredible uh, um, invention that kind of nearly really didn't really work out. You know, I, I know for some people, Kickstarter has the impression of like you know those late night um, televised and um, what do you call what are they called like the sort of like and it kind of start like QVC where they sell the invention that no one really ever thinks they want, but it's late at night, you're high or you're drunk or you're tired and you think you know you got some money in your bank account. Like, oh, fuck it, let me buy this Hoover that turns into a fucking uh, a bicycle or some shit you know it doesn't really things that no one really wants but i think this things might be really really practical for people out there that travel a lot especially the comedians and djs out there who travel quite often let's play a video and see what you guys think of it uh, uh put it here there we go does that sound a little bit there? hi my name is George Shibuda. I'm the inventor and founder of the Pull-Up He's German as fuck, isn't it? As a businessman wow, and looks a good, though. traveler, it's a bit bigger than a cabin. Two things annoy me more than anything else while traveling. Wardrobes... That's the best point, right? That's one. That's that's one of the things that still gets me hard this, to this day about product design, and about um, inventions, and about um, you know just technology in general, and about innovation. That's what really gets my dick hard. When somebody's out there, right? They have a they have a point. Um, they have a pain point. They have something in their life that really gets them annoyed, that really fucking aggravates them. And instead of moaning about it, instead of bitching, complaining on social media like people do with Twitter, ah, oh, it's not free speech, free speech, you're not letting me turn my thing up. They're shutting down conservative voices on YouTube and stuff. Instead of moaning, complaining, they actually sit down, they think, they put their money where their mouth is and they make an alternative, right? It might not work. It might not be something that's feasible. People might not want it or whatever it may be. But instead of using all that energy to just complain online, they actually invent and make something. They actually do. And that's something that I can always preach something that always makes me happy because all of our greatest inventions whether it's uber whether it's um delivery services whether it's restaurants a particular ilk or particular sort of like culinary delights whether it's like i don't know a clip or if it's a laptop stand there was somebody out there i was like you know what i'm getting annoyed of having to always put my laptop on top of books to write on why don't i make this little laptop rig uh, sell it on amazon for 50 pounds and it can sell itself without me even looking that's what i like to see more solutions less complaining Small hotel rooms are usually not very practical and there never seems to be enough room for my clothes. Or living out of the suitcase yeah, and true. always up being totally chaotic. Uh -huh. The pull-up suitcase is the solution to all of the issues and problems that wow. have annoyed me for many years. I'm extremely mobile, flexible. Wow, that is so cool. So essentially, if you're listening to the podcast app, instead of a normal suitcase, traditional suitcase that um, opens 
uh, like a book. This suitcase pulls up, hence the name pull-up suitcase. And as you pull it up, um, it's got like a, a foldable, like a, a collapsible uh, shelving unit. So shelves that go up and essentially each shelf has got this little pouch that you can put your t-shirts or your shirts or your suits inside and you can fold them and then slot them into the actual shelf. So essentially you're getting more in. You're, get, you're getting more in because you're folding everything and you put into a shelf and it can compress back into a suitcase. So then what happens is that when you go on holiday or you go away on your business trip and you're in your hotel room, you can essentially just pull it all up and just have that as your wardrobe. You don't need to put anything in wardrobes or you know take it out of the bags and put it into the wardrobe shelves of the actual hotel room, which I never like doing anyway. I know some of my more organized friends do that all the time, take out all their stuff of their luggage and put the shoes on the floor, put all the t-shirts and the thing. But I, I, just, like to, I just like to use my suitcase as the kind of overall kind of you know what's it called um what do you call what do you call it like shelving unit whatever you call right but sometimes over time when once you're in a holiday a lot of times and you have stuff that you want already you end up kind of piling all the clothes on top so this is a really good way to kind of get everything organized and then if you need to put all your dirty clothes in a plastic bag you can do because you know where all your clean clothes are really clever invention of my free time instead of wasting time in wow that is amazing all the shelves collapse and put in collapse into it let's be honest on business trips, you often arrive tired and exhausted at your hotel. Yeah, that is I know I do. That is exact situation that pull-up suitcase oh. will make your life easier. Wow. The pull-up is multifunctional, effective and easy handy. The only, the only thing that I'll say is bad about it is that it's not... Again, maybe because of size, maybe because of how um, the uh, the innovation needed and how to kind of pull it up, they probably couldn't fit it into a smaller form. It's not enough for... You can't put in an overhand luggage. It's not a carry-on. It's something that you're going to have to check in. That's the only issue I have with it. So you're going to have to check it in. So, you know, I'd imagine if you're a businessman and you're a high-flying executive or you're moving around the, the, the country or Europe or the world, you don't really want to waste time waiting for your luggage on a carousel all the time or checking it in ahead of time. You, want, you kind of want to be able to put in overhand luggage, sit down, put your headphones in, go to sleep, get up again, take it out, and you know what I mean? Keep it moving. Um, I'm, again, I'm, I would love to know how much time people actually waste compared to taking stuff out of the overhead luggage. I'm, I'm sure it might equate to the same thing. I don't know. People are always really quick to kind of run out of the plane and rush, especially on Ryanair flights. They're like always kind of rushing and scrambling. It's like, we were going to get out at the same time, really. They don't really get out any ahead of you as much as you think they do. You can never really kind of book, you can never kind of book a train ticket at a particular time when you're landing in a city, right? Because no, you're never sure you're going to land exactly the time it says you're going to land, right? You might be um, taxied on a, on a runway for a while because there's no space uh, for you guys to get out and shit. You might have to... St the plane might um, end up landing on the other side of the airport, especially if it's a budget airline, they land in, you know, really obscure parts of the airport they're having to take a bus back into the main bit of it. So there's no way of really kind of knowing how when you're going to land exactly you know the maybe rough time frame but not exactly so i wonder how much time you actually save but yeah it looks like a cool invention man confident that this one of a kind suitcase will also help straighten out your travel cars and make every hotel room and german engineering too to wow i like it and that's a good that's a good byline right make every hotel room feel like home which is you know the, the complete opposite of a hotel room because if any if there's anywhere in the world that doesn't feel like home it's sleeping on your friend's house right you always feel like you're not at home regardless if they make you feel comfortable regardless if they let you use your bed or the guys if they let you shit in their toilet you never feel at home in your friend's house because it's not your house and the second place you don't feel at home is a hotel room it's the most sterile fucking devoid of personality place you'd ever find in your life um the only place where i've kind of felt good and glitzy in a hotel room is when i've stayed in a kind of really posh hotel whether it's a kind of ace, ace hotel whether it's that hotel in la where i went in someone's room i went in someone's room when i was there um i think it's called the line or something it's in la everyone goes there i think when they go to coachella so it's the line or some of those i don't forgot what the name of it but those are only place that you actually feel nice so you actually feel kind of at home kind of but not really maybe chateau Marmont. that looks quite homely right it's a bit run down it looks like an old lady's home those celebrities go there and shit that might be the other place they feel at home but yeah this looks really cool i'll put a link in the show notes for you to check out uh the pull-up suitcase german engineered absolute brilliance a really cool idea i love i love i love i love uh, I think that might be it, you know, that's an hour, isn't it? That's an absolute hour, bang on an hour, here we are, oh my god. So, thanks again for tuning in to Excellence English Show, episode number 189, I'm keep going strong, I've got one last episode this week coming at you tomorrow, so keep on with that, that'll be more streetwear specific for if you're out there and you're wondering, where's the streetwear news, like, you know, you call yourself the number one streetwear podcast in the world, and I didn't get any streetwear from you, 
Don't worry, that's coming tomorrow. Streetwear Fridays coming at you nice and hot from the beginning to the end. Loads of streetwear industry talk, loads of news about new releases and all that stuff that you want to hear. Um, before I go, check out my website, axionzinger.com for listings regarding myself, DJ listings. As I mentioned before, I'm DJing this Friday at Tap East from a night called Tapped. Tap East in Westfield. Come down if you want to hear me play from 7 to 11. And, and I'm doing that for the rest of the month and for the rest of June. So you've got plenty of time to decide when you want to come down. Um, anything else regarding myself, social accounts, all those kind of malarkey, you want to write me an email, that can be found too on my website, xnozinga.com. Link in the show notes. If you're watching via YouTube, please give me a subscribe. Please give me a like. If you're a new listener or new watcher, let me know what you think. Leave a comment below. And if you're listening via the podcast app, a five-star review will go a long way into making sure people find what I'm talking about. Anyways, until then, until we meet each other again, take care of yourself and I'll see you guys very, very soon. Peace.